Hey everyone, welcome to The Thoughtful Entrepreneur. I'm your host, Jen Amos, and today I have with me the CEO and co-founder of Tangible Solutions, Adam Clark. You can learn more about him and his company at tangiblesolutions3d.com. And again, that's tangiblesolutions, the number three, d.com. Adam, welcome to the show. Awesome. This is great to be here. Thank you for having me. Really yeah. appreciate it. Absolutely. I know that uh, you mentioned that you typically work in your office for, uh, I think, four, four days out of the week for about 10 hours at a time. And this is uh, the one time of the week where you actually work from home. That is correct. Yes, we, um, we started doing the four hour or the four day work week. It's 10 hour work day. It's manufacturing. So for us, mm. you know, getting everyone in on the same time. And, and it was interesting little social experiment because we were trying to figure out how can we be a little bit more efficient? How can we just kind of come together you know, I think when you start as an entrepreneur, you know, you work all day long and you go True. and then you start bringing employees in mm. and you cannot expect them to work the, with the same vigor all the way through. Yeah. Um, and we wanted to bring a little bit of balance because we make orthopedic implants. And um, that was a little bit about just kind of getting into manufacturing. And Friday has been like a wonderful day for the managers to just either work from home or come in, clean up, get ready for the next week and kind of you know, um, not shave, you know, so, uh, th yeah. things of that nature, you know, yeah, it's so, kind of a anyways. way to just, uh, uh, kind of, uh, calm, what do you call it? Like just ease up from the week and, um, yeah. slow it down a little bit more. You're still working, but you're taking it a little bit easier and then setting yourself up for next week. So you can just kind of check out for the weekend. Absolutely. Yeah. Really clean things up. And I think that's one of the things, I mean, we'll talk about lessons learned, but balance, <laughs> you know, having a nice, mental balance because there there was a time where I was just burnt out mm. and the, the four day work week has allowed us even though we're going you know we're running and gunning all week long because uh, we start at six we end at five and uh, you know by the Wednesday afternoon it feels like Thursday morning for sure mm. you can tell it in the demeanor of everyone so <laughs> try to bring some donuts in on Thursday or whatnot but um, yeah. you know if we have to do overtime it's done on a Friday it's not done on a weekend people can still have that time to you know, be balanced and refreshed for when they come in on Monday morning. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. So in a way it's, it sounds like maybe Tuesday is like hump day for everyone because Friday, like Thursday is the last day where they have to be in the office and Thursday, they're already feeling like it feels like a Friday to them. Almost, it does. It, what it, sounds it like. does. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And it's, it's weird to hear like, have a good weekend on a Thursday, <laughs> you know, but that's awesome. Yeah, um, yeah I, I definitely want to dive into uh, balance a little bit more later because I know that is mm -hmm. something that a lot of us can definitely learn. Um, I thought I would just take the time to ask because you, you you did mention that you um, you do manufacturing and you do go into the office four days a week. Um, as we know, you know, 2020 is an interesting time uh, in history. And so I'm curious, uh, what has the new normal look like for, for you and your company? And has it really affected um, the way that you operate? You know, oddly enough, not really. Um, so we're a contract manufacturer of 3D printed titanium orthopedic implants, uh, mm -hmm. super focused niche. Uh, so we were an essential business and mm. uh, we, we kept operating, obviously, you know, bringing in some of the, um, the protective measures, mask, and we yeah. clean up and things are a little bit more organized. But for us, it really stayed the same. And being in orthopedics, looking at, you know, how they were impacted, they shut down all the elective surgeries, you know, elective surgeries eventually will become emergent. So surgeries were still happening. And the customers that we sell to obviously sell to hospitals and orthopedic surgeons themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so we saw a bit of a slowdown, probably about April. April was probably our worst month. But mm. overall, though, we're having a record year. Um, people are because everyone started prepping because all those surgeries are going to have to be done anyway. And so mm -hmm. sur surgeons at the hospitals are working you know, two, two day shifts are staying in the hospitals are continuously wow. running. And so it's been nice. Everyone, would, everyone slowed down. And then as things started to free up and though we don't have things clearly identified of what the future is going to look like, mm -hmm. everyone started to realize that, Hey, these business, these hospitals are businesses. They need to stay open so they can yeah. continuously serve the community. And part of that is driving revenue, getting surgeries going and uh, enabling them to come in. So they work through their nuances of being able to get back into the hospitals and making things work for themselves. And, and we just flew right, kind of right under the radar with them. <laughs> and, and I think being a smaller business as well, you know, we'll, we'll do about 3 million this year and, and we have some growth that'll be happening next year for us. Mm -hmm. But I think if we had been maybe a $20 million business probably would have taken a larger hit. Mm. Um, 
you, just because the carrying cost of operating a twenty million dollar organization is a lot heavier than what we're experiencing, and um, you know, it really makes you look at how you're practicing your financial cash flow, taking a look at things, how disciplined are you being, um, and it ex I think it exposed a lot of businesses, especially when it came to the PPP, all the the payment protection program, mm -hmm. you know, what I noticed, everyone was like, oh, it's not getting to the businesses. And I have friends who own their own companies, but, you know, they, they, their accounting was shoebox accounting, throw the receipt in and mm. the year, go to the account and whatnot. Right. But we took a practice about two years ago to just be locked tight on, on month to month, closing the month, having good financials, making sure everything was organized. So we were able to react very quickly. Mm -hmm. And I think if you're not practicing some of those disciplines that aren't necessarily what you sell, but it's part of your business, it, it can enable you to move a lot quicker when a pandemic hits. And you, know, you really have to open your eyes to say, all right, are we prepared for an economic downturn? Yes. But now everyone has to consider, well, now we have pandemics to consider as well. Right. Um, I called our insurance agent. That was the one thing we were not covered for was pandemics. <laughs> oh, I no. mean, who would have thought, you know, right, no, right. many people weren't. So a little business practices here and there. But again, as a smaller business, we were never used to getting on a plane and going to see customers, um, you know, going to trade shows, but once or twice a year, just budget didn't really allow being a smaller mm -hmm. business. So um, you know, if anything, it allowed us to practice what we did best even more because mm -hmm. a lot of our comp competitors were more established in the field and had the marketing budgets to go to these trade shows. And they counted on those trade shows right. where we were already doing video conference calls. And that was just a thing we had to do because we were small. And there was a point when I was running parts at three, four o'clock in the morning and then making sales calls, you know, doing both. I, you know, I don't have to do that now. We've worked ourselves into that luxury, but Mm -hmm. um, I think it exposed a lot of bad business practices for a lot of people, for us as well, to just kind of dial in and say, hey, these are things that we are doing that we need to maybe shore up and make sure, you know, we're tight on our cash and, you know, watching every penny where it goes, kind of getting back down into the weeds. You know, anytime you hit a crisis, you start to look at the receipts again. You know, what did we spend our money on <laughs> last month? And did we really need, you know, <laughs> those three extra microphones or monitors right, right. or fancy keyboards, things of that nature? Because it a makes point. a difference. And it's true. And it's a cultural thing, too. You know, if you're asking about that $10 bill, mm -hmm. employees are going to question, well, hey, if I spend this, they're going to ask me about it. Why? I better have a good justification. And uh, but it's also by example, too. You know, I don't. Mm -hmm. You know, my desk is right in the middle of the floor and everyone can see what I do. They can see what my desk looks like. Uh, they can see, I don't have all the fancy tools and this and that, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't want to ramble. So you got to stop. No, me if I start no, rambling. no, you're doing, you're doing great. I was, uh, I, I really appreciate what you're sharing. Um, this is an interesting time. I was just thinking in my head, like, you know, I think maybe there was a lot of businesses that were like, fake it till you make it. And then the pandemic mm -hmm. really kind of showed their true colors and, and showed oh, that sure. they're really a house of cards. It's like, Hey, you look really pretty and shiny on the outside, but you know, you paid way too much for that because no one can go to your store anymore, you know, or, Absolutely. you know, it's like, and it, it reminds me of uh, someone I was talking to who is in the oil industry and you know he, his company is actually doing just fine because just like what you said they took care of the little things like the, the things mm -hmm. i think that a lot of businesses tend to neglect or overlook because maybe they're trying to spend more than they should or you know making those right. impulse perfect uh, impulse purchases and everything and so mm -hmm. um no i don't think i don't think you're rambling at all and and i think that a lot of uh, business owners are really reevaluating the way that they've been running their business this whole time um or trying to pivot um really at this point and it sounds i mean obviously Obviously you're an essential business, so you didn't really have to worry too much about like having to pivot so much, but it's either way you, you did set your business up for success for a time like this and, and taking care of the accounting uh, end ahead of time. Yeah. And those are the things that you really don't want to do. You know, I don't love accounting, um, <laughs> but I love, right. what I love is manufacturing and mm -hmm. I love being on the sales side of things and working with customers. And I think early, you know, as you get into it, you know, it's a balance between, all right, finding the, at that time when you need to outsource and bring someone in to do that, to do those little things so you can focus. But there's mm -hmm. also a time when you just need to suck it up and do it yourself mm -hmm. um, and become an expert at it so you can effectively communicate to someone you're paying to really maximize their ability and to set them up for success as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because those little things will trip you up as you, as you are moving forward. Mm -hmm. You are looking at your vision and, and where you're walking towards. It's all the little things that will 
say, nope, you got to stop and come back and fix this. You now have to turn around from where you were headed, slow down, come right. back, fix it, and then walk it forward. So you're kind of rewalking those same paths. And I've certainly done that myself or just little mistakes, customer mistakes, paperwork, attention to detail. You know, it's really hard to, um, to manage that. But I think yeah. that's what makes successful entrepreneurs successful is just the devil is in the details at all times. So yeah, I really appreciate you sharing um, kind of this key advice on how to have a sustainable business. Like now that you've been almost uh, from what I have here in our notes about a decade um, mm -hmm. into this business, let, let's go back a little bit and sure. talk about before you started, because I have, I have here in my notes that you actually started out of your garage. <laughs> so we tell did. us like what yeah. were the early stages of that, you know, before you started business, how did you get into it? How did you get into orthopedic uh, implants? Yeah, so it, it is a funny story. So I was a Green Beret before and I got out and I started working at a defense company, just doing some program management. That's mm -hmm. where I met my business partner. Mm. Um, and then we just started working out for hours. And uh, there was actually a spare room that my manager at the time let me have to make cold calls during lunch. He's like, you can have 45 minutes a day to make nice. phone calls. Okay. And so cool, I would cool. go back in there and made some phone calls and because the company was downsizing and they were kind enough to let us know and allow people mm. to plan and whatnot. So, so we mm. kind of were set up in that way. Um, but, you know, I got out the Ranger handbook and we didn't know what business planning was. So we used the Ranger handbook and I was like, okay, uh, <laughs> you know, and we use that, you know, how do we, how did we mission plan in the army and kind of brought yeah. that. And we, we pulled out a map of Dayton, Ohio, which is where we are. We started mm -hmm. plotting where all the manufacturing companies were. Because at first, we were servicing everybody. We were 3D mm -hmm. printing anything for anybody. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, as we, we went door to door, started getting, our, uh, getting the word out there, trying to get into speaking engagement, trying to be, you know, preaching the gospel of additive mm -hmm. manufacturing. And while we were doing that, we started getting into... Um, uh, or not getting into, but we had more medical folks start, start to come. And mm -hmm. the request came, hey, can you print this? Can you do that? And, and we found an opportunity. A lot of our competitors were going into aerospace and we found this kind of blue water area that no one was servicing in 3D printed orthopedics. Mm -hmm. uh, we started working with some spine companies and as we were growing, we were still holding on to this base of customers that were not medical. Mm -hmm. And and I remember coming down the stairs one day because we have like an upstairs I was walking down stairs and one of our plastic machines was was down. We had three people standing around them, but we had five metal printers with titanium orthopedic implants that were really expensive and we can bill for it, but we got to move them. And mm. we were messing around with this small plastic printer. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, I started to question, what is our focus? What are we doing? And we had a board member to start to, be, you know, really question our identity of what did you, what did we want to be? And we really settled on orthopedics. We're like, all right, we're going to fire every other customer. And we had about wow. 300 customers at the time. Wow. Okay. And, and, you know, small guys to big guys. Yeah. And Still a big decision though, fired. 300 customers. Yeah. Yeah. I was scared. I had to like write out mm -hmm. a definition of what our customer was and paste it everywhere for myself. Mm -hmm. You know, right. there's tons of little shiny things that are out there, opportunities, especially when you're really need revenue, you know, Absolutely. <laughs> you need Absolutely. to pay the bills but you don't want to be distracted because it comes at its own cost. And uh, we decided to become a 3D contract manufacturer, 3D printed titanium orthopedic implants. And that was it. Wow. And we pushed everyone else aside and just really focused on that. And I'll tell you, that was the scariest, but best decision we ever did. And probably the biggest lesson that I would give to any entrepreneur is to absolutely at no matter, like all costs, focus. Mm. Focus, 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 because what it allowed us to do is start to recruit from the orthopedic industry, start to understand the workflow of the orthopedic industry. That's already it's a, a ton of knowledge right there yeah, just to yeah. try to capture, you know, working in aerospace, working consumers, working in, you know, different regulatory requirements, things of that nature. And we were able to really hone in and kind of the ripple effect from that was that we became experts in our field. Mm. So 3D printed orthopedics is a new concept. It's in its infancy. I mean, they've been doing it for about 10 years, but it, in reality, it's still rather new. Yeah. And so there was a lot of questions we were calling the FDA trying to figure out, you know, what are taking the questions our customers were giving us and then going back and like clarifying and becoming experts and then communicating that back to our customer base 
it really made us a valuable partner in their endeavor to launch a new product out into the field. And we've been able to sustain some long-term relationships because of that. Uh, just and organize our business in such a way where we look at the year and we know, hey, we're going to be heavy in this quarter. We're going to be heavy in that quarter. Um, you know, position the business to be experts in what we do. And we only deal with titanium, which has, you know, 3D printing titanium has its own nuances that you have to understand as well. The fixturing, all the downstream operations, it just is all wrapped around this idea of orthopedics. And so, mm -hmm. you know, it, we, the passion to people who have a passion for orthopedics and um, who understand the market. And I think that's been our biggest differentiator is, you know, we've, it, you know, you think when you like develop a niche, you're like, well, I'm going to be eliminating all this other opportunity. <laughs> right, right. And perhaps there's an argument, but however, you're also allowing yourself to focus and pour all that energy and resources into that yeah. one thing and be the best at it. And when you become the best at it, or, you know, I know I'm drinking my own tea or, you know, my own Kool-Aid here, but, <laughs> you know, we, we've gotten really good at this and we can pivot really well. And the, and the, and the, the all the customers are, are the same. They're bringing us the same problems. They're bringing mm -hmm. us the same products in, in a way, you know, it's all spinal implants or hip or knee, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of built this, uh, you know, knowledge base to really service them and get products cleared and no problem is something we haven't seen or things like that. I mean, we still see new problems, but it really allows you to just, you know, every time you learn something, it's applicable to your entire customer base. Yeah, um, absolutely. And that's been our, that's definitely been our, you know, the best decision we ever made was to get rid of all those other customers and to focus on big ticket items. It's like that classic, you know, 80% of your revenue comes from 20% of your customers. And, right. you know, I'll just never forget seeing all these people around a silly plastic printer that was <laughs> malfunctioning and then having five, you know, metal printers with wow. product that's ready to move, not moving because we're messing around with this little printer over here. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, we saw like that day uh, we went to Waffle House uh, talked to my business partner, like we really got to focus. Mm -hmm. And, um, then we wrote the definite, cause there were still little shiny little objects. Cause even I, I'd be like, Hey, this one thing, it came in. And <laughs> right. And, right. Uh, we'd, we'd literally look to the definition and be like, the first question was, is it medical? <laughs> right. Like, no. You know, I think that, we're not um, I think that a, a lot of people may underestimate the power of focusing and, and niching down. You know, I think they do. They mm -hmm. think like, oh, there's going to be less, there's going to be like less customers, there's going to be less like whatever. But in reality, it's like you really become an expert in that particular field and that particular community of people or clientele or industry and what have you. And so I really like that you pressed upon that. And that was a big risk that you took early on. I mean, at the time, sure. I think any business would be happy to have 300 clients in that capacity. But mm -hmm. for you to be like, okay, I got to, I got to paste my niche. I got to have my avatar like written out and in front of me everywhere yeah. to remind myself yeah. why I'm taking this leap of faith. And so, you know, I just want to, uh, you know, kudos to you, you know, for, for taking that risk. That. And obviously here you are almost a decade in practically, um, you know, being very successful and continuing to grow and, you know, continuing to flourish because as, as an essential business, like you still have to yeah. be around. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, and, you know, business is, it is about relationships, especially when mm -hmm. you're growing up and trying to mature the business, you know, it, you really, it, you build these relationships with people. And if you can constantly nurture those relationships, they're going to come back because now our relationships are not necessarily utilitarian in nature where we're just conducting business right. back and forth. Right. I mean, there's like a real genuine connection that I've been able to create with these people right. that you know, learn about their families. Where are they from? What makes them tick in the off hours? What, what passions do they have right. from a personal standpoint? And not that you leverage that um, facetiously in a way, but it, it is something that can be leveraged, these relationships, because you're going to have crap go wrong. Right, right. And if you can't pick up that phone and have like a genuine connection with that person, admit to your failures and, and, or, Hey, you guys messed up. You sent the wrong thing. You know, that kind of, you don't want to put blame on your customers, but mm -hmm. you want to have empathy for them. Absolutely. And if you, and if you can do that, that reoccurring revenue gets a little easier and you're able to kind of be a little bit more profitable as well at the same time without, and it allows you to not freak out. Like I need more customers now. <laughs> just, yeah. just calm down. You know, if someone <laughs> says they're not ready. It's okay. Right. You know, they'll come, they'll come back around. Just be the expert. 
Just be yeah. the expert that someone they can rely on and call and know that they're going to get a straight answer about what they're trying to accomplish. Yeah, no, definitely. Adam, you are uh, so full of wisdom. Um, obviously, you have learned a lot and gone through a lot um, with your business. Uh, before we go, I do have one more question to ask, and it's really just talking more about the entrepreneurial side for our small business owners and entrepreneurs listening to the show. And that's about balance. We, we, we talked mm -hmm. about a little bit about at the beginning, and I think for a lot of us, it's very easy. And I, I think about my husband and myself as well when we work on our projects. We don't, we don't set hours. Like I work, I work a lot. I work slow, but I work a lot because it's like, especially mm -hmm. in the pandemic, it's like what else am I going to do? And so, right. you know, let's talk a little bit about balance and how you have been able to master that. And also how, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm sure it's still a work in progress, but also sure. how, how your employees in a way were kind of the catalyst for you to start setting, you know, those boundaries and setting hours. Yeah. You know, you don't want to lose excitement in, mm -hmm. in the culture, you know, and I could, I could feel myself being burnt out. And one of my employees actually, uh, we have a gym at the shop and we were working out and I was just feeling it. And, uh, he was like, man, if you go down, the whole company's going to go down. He's like, They're going to follow you. And I was like, and like, it was very humbling. It was like, I didn't, I don't know. You don't really look at yourself as like the guy, you know, mm -hmm. even though I am like, I'm the CEO, they, like they are going to follow me, but they're going to do what I say. They're going to, or they're going to, they're going to, you know, do what I'm doing or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I really needed to take time, kind of set some hours at the shop, you know, make sure I'm getting home at a reasonable time and I'm not just like burning all the way through and, and adjusting the schedule. Like it's okay. Mm -hmm. It's okay right. to sit down and it's okay to think, you know, I cannot attest more to like lifting. I mean, I got, I ballooned up to like 260 or something like that. And just eating, you know, those habits outside of work, you know, mm -hmm. how you fuel yourself mentally, spiritually, you know, mm -hmm. making sure your personal finances are at home, taking care mm -hmm. of yourself, from mm -hmm. a financial standpoint, I think that's where a lot of entrepreneurs struggle right. because the business starts to do well, but they're like, no, I need that cash because I have to do X, Y, Z, or I got to get this piece of equipment. If you don't take care of your personal finances and kind of enjoy the fruits of your own labor a little bit, it's going to tax on you because yeah. you're not going to be able to kind of like, hit, like, you know, when I first started actually realizing that like, I need to probably pay myself a little more. Right. Once I was able to get that and I was able to do things for my kids and take them to the zoo and not be like, oh my God, I have no money. Right, um, right. Things, things like that. But you take that stress off. It allows you to get like more excited about the business because you're like, oh man, I can enjoy this even more. Like it starts to like that day comes when you're like, yes, I can, I can enjoy this. I can pay myself. I want to pay myself. I want to mm -hmm. pay my employees. Mm -hmm. um, there's that. And, and, you know, I think fitness and eating right um, you know, limiting your drinking and just knowing your priorities and, and during the week, I think it, people undervalue that. And uh, I think time to think, mm. being quiet, getting some alone time, not just like about the business, but like, how, like, is the business working for you? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. the business is not what you do, but it's, it's not the main thing of life, but it's what you're doing to propel your life. Mm -hmm. and I think kind of having that idea, you know, that, that thought and that time to be able to think about and ponder or just be silent for a minute and allowing yourself to kind of like think bigger, you know, cause you go day into day, day to day, you're in the weeds so much. You really have to pull yourself out and, and look abroad, like, how am I doing everywhere? Mm -hmm. And, and kind of check in the boxes just to make sure and continuously educating yourself, listening to books on tape. And, you know, I think once you've lost passion in the business, and you're so burnt out, the business is, is going to feel it and everyone else is going to feel it because you're not going to have that energy. You know, it's like when yeah. I get in in the morning, it's like techno music and it's like, <laughs> rah, 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 rah. you know, like Love we're just it. like, having, we're having a good time. And if you can't bring that energy, you got to check yourself and say, how can I bring that energy? Yeah. Um, because my employees are counting on me to bring the energy. Some days I feel like I haven't done anything except walk around the shop and just <laughs> check in with people. There you know, you I sit down at my desk. I'm like, what did I do today? But what did I do today was check in with all my employees, make sure everyone's doing well, having genuine conversation, not just checking a box, but like right, right. literally, how are you doing? You know, exactly. how's, how, how was that birthday party of your grandson or something like that? You know, um, and being mindful of that, I think is, is very important because what's cool is we did put that gym in and now we like we have a Slack channel that's like the Iron Eating Group, and we talk about we talk about weightlifting, we talk about running, or who's doing what program, or what new diet fad is out there, things mm -hmm. like that. So it's like allowed us to have something that's um, not just work to connect on, 
Right, and, uh, right. you know, people like, I mean, some of the people have lost some serious weight and they look good and they're excited and we're in orthopedics too. So we want to make sure we're setting an example Absolutely. of what we want to look at. And cause I remember I went to my first orthopedic, first orthopedic show and I just felt like, man, I am not just physically <laughs> feeling the way I want to feel, you know, awesome. Awesome. and so I was just kind of frumpy and wearing that old, old shirt, you know, like. And I just thought, you know, I got to like, if I want to, if I want to be treated like a CEO or, or a successful business owner, I got to act like one. I got to look like one. And, um, you know, no one can wear sweatpants at the shop anymore. <laughs> Things like that. You got to elevate your, you got to elevate your game a little bit. Yeah. Um, you know, so. Well, awesome. Well, Adam, uh, obviously we can go on forever with just all the words of wisdom that you have shared today. Um, unfortunately, with all good things, they eventually do have to come to an end. So uh, yep. again, thank you so much for being on our show today. I know that our listeners will really benefit from this. Um, and yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure having you. So thank you so much for your time, Adam. I really appreciate you having me on. Best of luck to you. Keep rocking it. And uh, yeah, we'll be <laughs> checking you out as well. Thank you. And again, this is Adam Clark, the CEO and co-founder of Tangible Solutions. If you want to learn more about him and his company, check out tangiblesolutions3d.com. All right. Thank you all so much for joining us and tune in next time.